Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the 20th anniversary of the Jewish Film Festival of Fairfield County. My name is Nancy Schiffman, and I'm the Director of Arts and Culture at the Stanford Jewish Community Center. The Jewish Film Festival of Fairfield County has 20 year history of bringing current award winning films to the Fairfield and Westchester County communities. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors, both individuals and organizations, whose generosity makes the festival possible. Although we're not at the State or Garden Cinema any longer, I'd like to thank the Friedman family and Garden Homes Management for their continued support and dedication to the Jewish Film Festival of Fairfield County since its inception 20 years ago. A special thank you to AJC Westchester Fairfield for their sponsorship of the festival. I'd also thank our co-sponsors for the closing festival film, Tiger Within, Temple Bethel and Temple Sinai, who have been longtime supporters of the Jewish Film Festival of Fairfield County for many years, and it means so much to us. We're incredibly grateful to our festival co-chairs, Jennifer Kaufman, Debbie Lee, and Lisa Popper, along with our tremendously dedicated festival committee members who work endlessly year round, screening hundreds of films and are tasked with selecting the top six. Lastly, our deepest appreciation to you, our audience, whether you followed us over the past two decades or if you're new to us, whether you joined us in person or virtually, thank you for being part of the Jewish Film Festival family building community through film and meaningful conversation. And that's just what we have in store for tonight. We are so thrilled to have with us talking about their deeply moving film, Tiger Within, multi award winning film director and producer Rafal Zelinsky and renowned screenwriter Gina Wincos with moderator Dr. Uh, Betsy Stone. And we have a wonderful treat tonight, a surprise to all of us. We have Margot Josephson, who starred in the films. I'd love to tell you a little bit about the film and these wonderful folks. Tiger Within stars the late, great, multi-Emmy award-winning actor, Ed Asner, and newcomer, as we just said, Margot Josephson. This is Margot's first big role on the big screen, and we're just delighted to have you join us tonight. It was a great treat. Um, uh, really just a few minutes ago is when I found out she could join us. Um, there's so many layers to this film, whether anti-Semitism, hate, fear, ignorance, powerlessness, self, the need for self-protection, courage, family, the power of unconditional love, and so much more. I hope we all learn how to embrace the tiger. It's an honor and absolute privilege to welcome Rafal Zelinsky, who has directed over 25 feature films, ranging from award-winning independent films, where his heart truly lies, to more mainstream Hollywood projects and television. In his early years, he spent growing up in Eastern Europe, and while in grade school, he was lucky to travel several times around the world and gain global perspective, an eight millimeter camera always at his eye. He was schooled in North America, the Middle East, and the Orient. During high school, he was fortunate to attend the prestigious Stowe School in England, where he achieved, where he received the Duke of Edinburgh Award, enabling him to make his first documentary film about the temples in Southern India. He went on to graduate, to graduate from MIT with a Bachelor of Science in Art and Design, focusing on the new fields of art and technology, and studied cinema verite documentary filmmaking with veteran Richard Leacock. After gradu graduating from MIT, he went on to direct several award-winning documentaries, gradually moving towards drama and becoming more and more interested in storytelling. As an independent filmmaker, Rafal has always generated his projects either by creating an original story that he was passionate about, then collaborating with several screenwriters, or adapting works from the theater in collaboration with respective playwright. On most of his independent films that he directed, he also served as his own producer, then producing through his own company. The first feature, Hey Babe, starring Buddy Hackett and Yasmin Bleat, premiered at the FilmX, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, Te Ormina Film Festival, and was shown in the Toronto, Montreal, and FIIF, AFI Film Festivals. 
he is sold exclusively to Showtime in the US. The film is sold exclusively to Showtime. Fun premiered at the Sundance Film Festival where it received two special jury awards for acting achievement and went on to show at 25 international film festivals. The film opened theatrically at the Film Forum in New York and received two nominations for Best Newcomer Performance and Best First Screenplay for IFP Spirit Awards. Ginger Ale Afternoon, based on the play by our Gina, who is with us today, premiered in competition at the Sundance Film Festival and was picked up by Squirrus Pictures, probably pronounced that incorrectly, you can correct me, for domestic theatrical release in the US. Downtown, A Street Tale recently received its world premiere at the AFI Film Festival. And his latest two indie films are Bohemia and Age of Kali, which was written by Los Angeles playwright John Stepling. In the mainstream arena, he was directed, he has directed numerous popular genre projects, ranging from the highly successful film Screwballs, which generated three sequels, which Raphael directed as well, and Hangman's Curse, in which he gave Leighton, uh, I'm sorry, Leighton Meester from Gossip Girls, her first starring role, as well as numerous television shows such as Highlander and Poltergeist. It is a privilege to welcome award-winning writer, Gina Wenkos. You know, we have heavy hitters here, so this is quite an extensive uh, portfolio and really thrilling. Um, when uh, Gina Wenkos' work includes box office hits like Coyote, Ug uh, Coyote Ugly, the Princess Diaries, The Princess Diaries 2, Jersey Girls, The Perfect Man, and Do No Harm. This successful film writer, however, did not originally set her sights on a career in the movie business. Born in Florence, Italy, and raised in Miami Beach, Wencos, the daughter of a gifted and, and um, I'm sorry, the daughter of a portrait painter at the Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami, was artistically gifted and majored in painting at the Maryland Institute College of Art. Relocating in New York City in the 80s when the city was in the midst of a cultural renaissance that spawned groundbreaking experimental theater and avant-garde multimedia performances, uh, Gina quickly became a fixture in the visible art world and then on to theater, uh, the theater scene writing numerous off-Broadway plays. Soon after, she moved into writing and producing for TV shows such as Crime Story, Wise Guys, My Two Dads, Can't Hurry Love, Good Advice, and The Family Man, just to name a few. Her talent is diverse and widespread, and we are just so thrilled to have you. Um, to lead us in the discussion, I'm thrilled to introduce Stanford's own Dr. Betsy Stone. Betsy's a retired psychologist who currently teaches as an adjunct lecturer at Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, her, her classes include human development of ed, for educators, the spiritual life cycle, adolescent development, and teens in and out of crisis. She also teaches a parent-child class in her synagogue, Temple Sinai of Stanford, one of our sponsors for tonight's film, and has worked with other rabbis and Hillel's. Betsy's an engaging speaker whose passion for the lives of teens and their parents has brought her invitations to teach all over the United States. She has worked with the Jewish Education Project on multiple webinars and, and live teaching opportunities as well, including trips to Broadway shows, character strengths and bullying. She was part of a series of national webinars addressing the Netflix show, 13 Reasons Why, and many other webinars and seminars focusing on teens and parenting issues. It's my absolute honor and privilege to have all of you with us here this evening to speak about your absolutely magnificent film, Tiger Within. Um, really, what a truly wonderful film. And there's so much to ask you about and so much to talk about. Um, and not all the time do we are we able to have the, the writer, the director, producer, as well as the star, one of the stars. And um, really, it's a true honor. So at this point, I would just love to pass it along to you, Betsy, to take the floor and take it away. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing about the film. Thank, Thank you, Nancy. Nancy, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you to the people in, in who are attending. Um, and thank you so much for the really fascinating movie. Um, 
I, my first question, and I don't know whether or not this question is for Rafal or for Gina, where did the idea come from? What made you think of this, um, this movie about redemption? Because I think that is really what it is about. Yeah, definitely Gina, because she wrote the script. Okay, well, um, I wrote this a long time ago, 30 years ago. About, yeah. And um, I was working in television at Columbia Studios in Hollywood. And at the time, that's where they were. And I would take a break and walk to what looked like a very beautiful park for just to get out of the studio for a bit. And I quickly realized uh, it wasn't just a park, it was a Jewish cemetery. And there was just a, a solemn grace to the place. And I just would return and return. And um, it was usually empty. And I just thought, what were these lives like? Um, how did they land in America? Who did they leave behind? How many of them were in the Holocaust? What are their children like? And, and then I thought at the time, um, of course, being anti-Semitic, at least in New York and in LA, wasn't as prevalent a topic as it is now. Um, and I never realized how much of a topic it would become. Um, I thought, what would happen? And I knew that there was in the middle of the country a great belief from many people. I knew that then. They just didn't believe in the Holocaust and didn't understand the significance of the symbol. And I thought, what would happen if a survivor met one of these incredibly ignorant kids? Because for me, I believe the hate comes from the ignorance and the ignorance feeds on each other. And, um, and that's where the idea came from. And I just said, I, I wrote it on what's called spec, meaning no one paid me to write it, I owned it. And um, I just wrote it because I felt it. I felt it in that territory. And you, I, that was I'm it. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that was Please. Did you did you know did you do you know survivors so that what, what how much of the story was influenced by um, stories you heard and how much of it was influenced by you know some stories that came, that were that spontaneously came out of you? Um, I think it. I think I've always had a kinship with the sense of isolation and separateness and um i don't I, i've since met survivors but i hadn't at that time i knew i knew survivors children um mm -hmm. and i would speak with them not that it directly influenced the movie it's just i know that's a very unique generation of kids that are now you know 40s 50s whatever the kids um and I, I, but that's a secret of world, the children of the survivors. Mm -hmm. they, they embody something that is um, hard to define and unique to them. So I can't say it directly. I just, growing up, um, you know, uh, the Holocaust, of course, was mentioned in school, whatnot. But I just, I thought there was something unique to the Germans that they could behave like that. And I've only in recent years realized, no, it's it has nothing to do with the fact that they were an organized society or all the things that all the professors talked about. It's what we're seeing now, just stupidity and what I call lazy thinking. Ignorance, ignorance. Rafael, why did you, what what about the movie, um, the script appealed to you so that you felt you felt that directing it and producing it were important to do right right now? Right. Well, I was very touched emotionally by the story. It it made me cry, and um, I was so moved, you know, by by the deep emotions in the relationship between Samuel and Casey. And I just love these two characters and I love the contrast between them. So emotionally, I was very touched. At the same time, there was so much wisdom in the script, so many messages and gifts that Samuel gives Casey. 
you know, lessons, beautiful lessons. They're so intelligent and I think um, speak so much to to all audiences all around the world, you know. So, so the mixture of the deep emotions with the, um, the intelligence, the wisdom, um, and also, you know, all the other aspects about the film, the contrast of the young and the old, the, the, you know, being able to work with a really well-known actor who could give it a lot of depth and seasoning and to discover a new actress, you know, which was all very exciting because I had done the fun, a movie called Fun before, where I discovered two teenage actresses who became very well known. So that was exciting and challenging. But also I was personally very touched by the story because, you know, my mother is half Jewish and she married uh, her grand, my mother's mother married a Polish man. They lived in Białystok. Bialyc, and my mother kept on telling me, you know, all the stories. In a way, they were survivors, but they they never ended up in the camps. But, um, you know, we, uh, my grandmother was always very involved in the Jewish community. All the Jewish people in the village loved her and they would come over, you know. And then when the Germans came, it was a very dangerous situation. I, my mother, you know, kept on telling us how the, my, my grandma had to hide them underneath the floorboards because my mother looked Jewish you know, and she was afraid that she would be taken away. So they lived in this constant fear. And then she was telling me stories how they were walking down to the market, you know, to get food while carts of Jews were being dr driven the other direction to the camps and they could not help. You know, they were lucky that they were not taken away, but they were afraid to interact or show any emotion, you know, while the Germans were patrolling the road. So all these stories, you know, um, touched me deeply. And I saw a lot in this film that I thought I could personally bring. And also, you know, having coming from Poland, because half of our family is Jewish, half is Polish, I experienced a lot of um, a very, you know, it's a, a complicated relationship that Poland has to, to do. So there's a lot of anti-Semitism. Um, and, you know, but some of it, you know, there were a lot of Polish people during the war who wanted to help, but they were afraid because they would be punished, you know, by the Germans. So they wanted to, you know, as good Christians, they wanted to take Jews in and help and, you know, try to shelter them from being taken away. Why at the same time they lived in fear? But there was another group which was very anti-Semitic because for generations and for ages, you know, the two did not mix very well in those villages. There were not a lot of education and, the, you know, the Jews kept very much to themselves and the Polish to themselves. So there was a lot of like, you know... Uh, suspicion. Suspicion, yeah. There was a lot of... Um, so it was a complicated situation that Poland has, you know. And being Polish and, you know, being Polish in Hollywood, it's also a situation, you know. It, right. where I, I almost experienced it in a way too. So I thought that it, it had all these complications, which I love. You know, I think it, the more complicated the film is, the more interesting it is. I, there's, that's the undeniably true. Personal connection right. on top of it and all these complications and layers, I thought it would be like a rich soup to explore. Lovely, lovely. Margo, what brought you to the film? Well, I didn't end up actually... Um, unknowing about it I wasn't even going to get the audition because I was so young and I remember uh, I was in another audition for I think it was a commercial and Rafael actually approached me um, and asked me to do some you know promotional photos for the film and um, I said yes I ended up doing them and I just I remember doing it and I just felt like I loved Casey I loved this character and then Rafael asked me to audition so and then yeah. Yeah. It was, what about? Go yeah, ahead. I'm sorry, Rafael. It was just a magical moment. I was with my son. You know, I'm trying to get my son to, to audition for some commercials, and I saw this these eyes, these amazing, deep, piercing eyes. And I looked, and it's this girl, and she looked so interesting. And she was sitting with her mom. That was like drawn, you know, to her. And I asked her mom, "Is your daughter an actress? You know, what is?" You know, and the mom said, no, she's just learning. She's, she is, um, you know, wants to be an actress and she's auditioning. So I said, well, we're trying to make this movie, Tiger Within, about a skinhead girl on the streets. And 
we need a model to take photographs so we can use it for a poster and publicity so we can raise money. So we started off by you know, having Margot on a photo shoot, the photographer. We went downtown and we dressed her up like a homeless kid and she melted right in and she became the character. I was talking through her doing these improvs, you know, through the scenes and she really became Casey. So I said, you know, you've got to audition. And the casting director was very, very like re resistant. Oh, how, you know, no, we're going to only bring like actresses who, with agents, experience, you know, you don't want to, no, no, no. But I insisted that Margot come and she was the last one. And she just blew us away with her audition. I mean, she was so deep and emotional and so wise, you know, she had such wisdom that she gave in those few scenes that she read and she became all emotional and there were like tears flowing and <laughs> man, we were like touched. I mean, Gina was there, we were there together. We looked at each other and like, oh my God, you know, right? We felt We're like, done, we're done, right. It felt, right. It did we felt like a school. dream. Yeah. It was not, not on, on the next thing was I invited Margot to Ed's house. And I had no idea what that was going to be like, you know, I mean, here's a very famous actor. How is he going to behave with a totally unknown, you know, but he was so respectful and they started reading scenes together and they were just wonderful. And then what really touched me was I asked them to walk together and just the sight of them walking together, he's limping and wobbling and she, you know, held his arm. It just, I was so, I, I mean, I just teared up just seeing them walk together. It was just, the scene from the movie, you know, that's, that's. So if it, if my head is going in lots of different directions, but what I want to start with right now is Marco, what did you learn from um, Mr. Asner? I mean, I, I, I learned, um, he taught me a lot about, you know, acting and, and his craft. Um, the biggest thing that I learned was to slow down. I had always been told for years, you need to slow down. You're going too fast. You're not feeling it. You're not feeling anything. And I remember my first scene with Ed, it was just something clicked, something happened. And I barely remember doing the scenes afterwards with him just because I, we were both so in it. That's, yeah, it was really beautiful. So was there a sense of, um, of was there a, a, a sense of discriminative power? I mean, he's a guy who's been out in the field for a very long right. time. Um, right. Were you his partner? Were you his um, assistant? How did how did that work between? He made me feel like his partner. Okay. I never felt like he was trying to. He was just he was very helpful with me and very sweet. And I felt like he was really trying to guide me. And I never felt that he was like above me. I feel like we were. We he treated me like we were on the same level, which was nice. That's lovely. That's lovely. Yeah. So yeah, he was very I, generous. You know, very generous and very. He, he's a very beautiful heart. He's a very deep, deep heart and a lot of wisdom. He knows so much and his memory is just amazing. He knows everything and remembers everything. So, to, so um, you know, his wisdom, he knew how to work with Marco right there and then, you know, he knew how to do it. And he was by just letting her be, you know, by not imposing anything on her. And I, I used that approach in the directing, you know, having come from a documentary background, that I tried to avoid directing them too much. It was just more about blocking them and setting up the situations, but not really impose on the um, how they were going to act the scene, because then it would have become mannered and would have been um, maybe less truthful. And you know, I was searching for truth. And Gina was there also, you know, um, very often rewriting scenes as we went along and. She was very helpful to Ed because sometimes he would switch lines around or, you know, he's 94. So sometimes he would forget something and changed it. And so Gina was always there to, to help make sure that he kept as much as possible to the truth of her script. But he did improvise a couple of wonderful pieces, moments, you know, which we used in the film. Which were the improvised pieces? It was that piece when he started talking about elephants and humanity and how he lost faith in humanity and there was another planet, you know, like, you know, he was at, he, he was starting to look at it in a very, very wise, all-encompassing way. 
you know, he's well, so, and it is the wisdom in, of in the, in the races, you know, of the film. He saw it beyond anti-Semitism. He saw it as something that applies to the whole world at large, to all races and all conflicts that are going on. He really saw this whole very universal vision and he improvised it into that scene, which I thought was really beautiful because he elevated the, the film to something way beyond what originally, you know, was just a story about him and her. Right, right. Almost like an international film. Right, exactly. Gina, I had two logistical questions that I was surprised by um, that I think, I think they're questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. One was um, th the, the choice to put the tattoo on his chest rather than his arm. Um, I actually didn't know, I, I, I've actually, I've been on the March of the Living a couple of times, three times. I've been to a bunch of places in Poland that are not happy places for Jews. I had no idea that um, that, they, that they they ever tattooed people right. on their chest. That's the piece of research, you know, we'll say, right. but we found it's a fascinating piece of research that originally when um, the prisoners were sent to, you know, the cultures that they were originally stamped on the chest and a lot right. of other races were stamped. And in the end, they, they developed a more industrial way. With so, Gina, why did you choose- It was choose... a very painful process where they did it, you know, with like this stamp to with this, with this really horrible looking instrument. And there's only one survivor apparently who just remains, who still has one on his chest. So we thought that was interesting, you know, that let's make people question, let them discover things that they haven't learned, that we haven't seen, because everyone, it's almost like a cliche, you know. Right, right. I was surprised by that, was and I went and looked it up. Because in the, we were shooting a scene earlier where we, the makeup artist forgot to put the numbers. And then when we, this, when we started shooting the scene in the diner, we realized, oh my God, we, we had forgotten the numbers, what are we gonna do? So Gina immediately scrambled and started researching on her computer. And we were like, oh my God, do we go back and reshoot the scene we had shot yesterday? And this is how we discovered it, right, Gina? That's so interesting. And Gina, how was the decision made to keep the family photographs, those two really moving and important photographs, why were they in the bathroom? Because I think that Ed's conflict has, uh, not Ed, Samuel's, Samuel's conflict, right. has been that I felt um, that were it I that suffered what he suffered, I would not recover. Mm -hmm. I, I think it takes, um, it takes a quality that I don't have. Uh, at least, and I hope I never find out whether I have it or not. Right. But he was dead. And um, I think when I was very young and I saw the pawnbroker, it just affected me so much. I mean, I was a young teenager and I was like, what? <laughs> because, you know, they didn't really show that where I went to school. And I was like, are you kidding? And, and I think that, and the funny thing, the strange thing and that I feel was kind of God sent be, years ago, 20 years ago, I met with Rod Steiger at a very, very fancy place for lunch, a Hollywood kind of place. Of course, he died. Great actor from Pawn Broker. And he wanted to do the. We were talking about the movie and this had never happened to me before. We're sitting there in this posh restaurant, you know, industry restaurant. And a very elegant lady wearing Chanel, like ladies who lunch kind of thing, was sitting right next to us and with her girlfriend. And she took her jacket off and she, I could see her, Rod couldn't, and she had numbers. And I was like, I mean, here we are in Brentwood, California. And it was so mystical to me. And I'm like, Rod, look. And, and he just, we, it was this moment. And those numbers to reduce somebody to a number, which is no different really than reducing somebody to a profile or reducing somebody just to, I mean, I disagree with Raphael in that I don't believe the movie 
was just between Samuel and Casey. I believe the circumstance is applicable to what we're going through now and to any form of hatred. I, I enjoyed Ed's elephant speech, but um, the, the pain that the character speaks of or is harmed by resonated in a way with Casey because even though she had no verbal ability to express her pain, and that's how when, you know, when people don't know how to, um, to talk, when they don't know how to uh, really dive in and feel the pain, it comes out in what I feel, and forgive me if this is against somebody's feeling, but in the uh, Kyle Rittenhouse feeling of where does that come from? You know, what is America? And I just right. feel that Casey's world is that kind of um, black, white, very um, aggressive. Sharp edges, sharp yes. edges. Yes. Yeah. And it's taking no time. I mean, I do know people that think this way, um, surprisingly. I mean, there were people that I knew that, you know, politics just doesn't come up. You know, I'm not a political person and it just didn't come up. And when this whole period happened and to see where people align themselves, you're like, whoa, I did not know that about you. And to me, Casey comes from that same world where people are working hard, getting nowhere, getting angry, feeling, blaming other people, you know, in our country, yeah, it's Jews, but it's typically been Blacks and Mexicans. And in New York, it was the Puerto Ricans. You know, it's like, it's always going to be somebody until you look at yourself. And right. that's what I feel America should be crying for what happened this week. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm not going to argue with you because I agree with you, but I'm going to, I'm going to take us back to the film okay. if I may. Okay, please. Yes. Um, I'm still so Mar upset about it. I can't yeah, even Agreed. Believe. Agreed. I cannot believe. Yeah. Margo, when the movie was being shot, um, did you start, I, I'm kind of curious is the order in which um, the movie was was shot was did you start as a skinhead and get redeemed or and and how was it to move from this very angry distressed um disoriented really kid to uh, what was the transformation for you as an actress um First of all, I, I want to say that I'm so grateful that I did this film when I was 14 because I think it was a very wise choice to choose someone young because it helped play it in with the um, the ignorance where I feel like now if I played Casey, it would be a lot different. Um, I think during the film, we, we kind of skipped around filming. So we didn't like start at the beginning and, and end at the end. We, we would do different scenes, um, especially because we were guerrilla shooting, meaning like we were just, you know, um, shooting all over LA we I don't think we could have you know worked in the order but as far as the trend Casey's transformation went um the biggest the I, I think the, the biggest time where like I felt the most like the skinhead was really like my wardrobe changes and my makeup because when I was put in those clothes and when I was put in that makeup I felt like okay well this is who I am this is who I have to be and that's who I portrayed Whereas like, as we were shooting some more scenes towards the end of the film, when I was in, you know, like the skirts and the, the fresher makeup, um, I was just something in my head was like, okay, now this is who I'm playing. So I would subconsciously um, play that version of Casey. And I think that that shows in the film. How, where did the, um, where in you at 14 did that um, sense of, isolation and neglect how were you so able to let us know how messed up this kid was yeah um where did it come from in you well when i first read the script i remember just relating so much to her i had 
a lot of the same, maybe not the same circumstances exactly, but I did have the anger and um, I'm, I'm a very, I'm very stubborn. That's something that I think Casey and I have the most in common. I'm very, very stubborn. So if I want something, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to get my way. At least that's how I used to be, um, especially at, at that age. And the anger and, and the hatred really just, I mean, I did have an interesting childhood. So I feel like that played in to my character and, and with Casey. But I could relate to her in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. That's really and yeah. And Asner is at um Rafael, he's at the end of his life. Um, both as as Samuel and as Asner. Um was there a particular wisdom that you felt he wanted to share with us, with his audience? Oh, very much so. I mean, this really, this he saw this as a uh, canvas to say a lot of things that he wanted to say for a long time. And he had written books, you know, he's written books about anti-Semitism. He's, you know, he's a liberal. He's a lot of things to say. But somehow through the, this, you know, through the things that um, Gina wrote, he saw a, a, an opportunity to express this in a, in, a, in a very deep way between the lines, you know, because he, he, he was very universal towards the end. You know, he really, I mean, he, he said, you know, I've, there is a lot of holocausts that have happened in the world and a lot of holocausts happening today. I mean, it's the first thing he said, you know, when we, because we went to do like a little interview with him just to get to know him. So one day, one afternoon we went and we shot like a three hour interview when I just asked him, you know, why do you want to play this film? What, what is it about the script that interests you? And then he started talking about <coughs> Rwanda, you know, and what's going on in, <clears throat> you know, in Syria, in the Middle East, in Africa. <coughs> and he, um, he had a very, very universal mind, you know, very deep mind. And at the same time, he was very committed to showing the Holocaust, you know, and teaching about the Holocaust and how the Holocaust, you know, denial is spreading across the country and how people are forgetting it. And so he, he, he wanted both to teach people about, you know, young people about the Holocaust, while at the same time, sort of taking a deeper look at it as what's wrong with humanity, you know, what's wrong with humanity and how come this has happened for decades and it's happening now and may will happen in the future, you know, why are human beings the way they are? So he, um, he saw all of that in this film and he did it in a very subtle way without pushing it, you know, which is I think the strongest way. Right. So I right. felt we were dealing with someone who, you know, who was almost like a master, you know, like a guru in a way, a master. I'd like to add we on to that. To, we really had to learn from him. Yeah, uh, yeah. We Go master, ahead. You know, we were Go very ahead. In, in fact, this has happened quite a lot. And I don't remember if Ed and I spoke about this specifically, but we spoke about it, which is people have said to me often, um, they always are non-Jews, but, you know, nonetheless, they say, well, why is the Holocaust so important? You know, there's been all these other actions, blah, 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 genocide, blah, blah, blah. And it's not that it, that the deaths in the camps were more significant than any other genocide, but it's our expectations. I expect more from learned men than which were the Nazis. In fact, I just coincidentally read an article recently about um, the IQs of all of Hitler's cabinet, so to speak. They're all very, very high, all of them above, you know, in, like several ingenious territory. And I say, my answer to people is no, it's not that, you know, it's like, why are you harping on the Holocaust all the time? You know, I'm sure we've all heard that. And it's not that the Holocaust is worse than any other mass genocide. It's that if you don't have the same expectations of like a 12 year old, like running around with the Khmer Rouge with being forced to carry a gun, you know, right. um, you, you, you have, you hope that as human beings evolve and as they read and they learn as 
the Nazis did, the Hitler's crowd, that that they have more to offer the planet, the people. And we don't, I don't, ha I don't think that of a little kid in the jungle that's forced to carry a gun. Right, I right. I expect more. And that's the difference. Okay. So that, and, and so some of that has to do with our own sense of what, of how we use intelligence for good rather than for evil. Well, um, hopefully. The, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a question. Lack of, um, lack of education or maybe mis, miseducation because through the internet, you know, people get a simplified, distorted view. So in a way, we're more aware, you know, we have more education, we're more aware of the world, but at the same time, we're getting more and more narrow-minded and limited. So it's really fascinating, the double, um, you know, the, the complexity of it. Complexity. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, we have a question from th that's in the Q&A and then Karina also has a question. So the question in the Q&A is about the beautiful graphics. Um, can, you, can you talk about the beautiful and creative graphics that enhanced the they film? Should. Well, well, what happened is that um, this came to us about halfway through the film, believe it or not. Um, there was a costume wardrobe assistant who we were filming the scene in the club and, and I noticed she was sitting in the corner and, and she was uh, drawing, scribbling and writing something in a diary. And I picked over this diary and I said, my God, can I see this? And, and she said, okay, she was. <laughs> and she, I opened this diary and it was the diary of a teenage girl, a very complicated diary with like thousands of drawings and, and writings and like, uh, and I said, my God, this is Casey's diary. We must use this in the film. Can we please film this? And she said, okay. So we, you know, so we started incorporating those drawings from there on as we were shooting the movie. Like we had still had to shoot Casey's bedroom. So we put drawings all over her bedroom. So it became part of the character. And then we took it a, another dimension later after in the editing, my wife who's an artist, um started doing animations to embellish you know moments in the film which gave the film almost like a, a, another dimension and we always have this disagreement with gina it helped us in the last scene because we could not afford to shoot the last scene the way it was written it was supposed to be a real real tiger that comes over and almost bites her hand off and then ends up licking her hand it was like a symbolic beautiful gesture but you know, to do that right, you have to create a three-dimensional tiger, um, you know, computer generated and that, you know, we just couldn't afford it. So in a way, having her draw the tiger helped that scene and, and hopefully came close to the way Gina, you know, wanted it. That and clearly integrated that part of the movie with the previous, with right. the and movie as it had. The ending, because we wanted to show that in the end, after Ed dies, is a drawing of a family and it's a birthday party and there she is and we see the two parents the, you know and her mother still and the boyfriend and you feel this sense of hope for the future yes you absolutely do karina can you share your question with us you'll have to unmute yourself and maybe even make yourself visible I think she has to unmute her camera and unmute her her loudspeaker on the left co bottom corner. Yeah, I've asked her to do that, but because this is a webinar, she might not be able to do that. Okay. So let's have you just speak her question. I so I do, Karina, I'm not sure I have your question. So if you would put it in the Q and A, that would be really helpful, um, and that way we'll we'll have it. Um, I, I it went back and forth between the sense that the that this theme of the movie was redemption and the the sense that the theme of the movie was kindness, um, and um, that that the healing power of love. When you when we when we. I, I kind of want to ask you to to put those two together for me. What's the connection between redemption and love? Well, I guess we should both answer that, Gina. Right? Well, okay, I'll start. In your own individual way. 
Well, I believe that if you're filled with hate, you know, it's like imagining a glass filled with water. If it's filled and it's putrid water, there's there's no room for anything else. And until you empty the glass, you can't put anything good in it. And I don't, I think that for Samuel, his experience, which I wrote based on how I would be, which was dead um, and just hopeless, was just ready to pack it in, done. He's not gonna kill himself because that's a violation, but he had nothing left. And it wasn't until the miracle of her entering his life and the great, in my opinion, the great courage Samuel took to speak to the most repulsive child you could find. Not, phys not physically, but what she symbolized. And he knew what we didn't know, which was that he had promised his wife to, if he could stop hating. She was the only one he didn't hate. And if he could stop hating, then there's room for life. And she inadvertently, certainly, um, Casey, Casey opened that for him. And he um, he found it. And I don't think, you know, I know it's very um, popular to say, oh, forgive, forgive. I don't think he forgave. He just learned to hate less and love more. And I just wanted to add to that, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's controversial what I'm going to say, and maybe some people won't like it, but um, I think love is the most powerful thing in the world. It's the thing, it's light, it's love, it's God, it's love. It's the most powerful force. But it can be used in a very negative way. Um, when, when a group of people, whether it's the Taliban or this group or that group, love themselves or Jews, you know, love themselves more than others and are maybe not capable of loving the other as oneself, it creates jealousy and anger and racism. And I think that is the problem with the world, you know, where people seem to love themselves more than they love the other. So unconditional love is a way to rising above that. They just learn to love the other. In, it's an African-American or this race or that race or this religion. Let's love this religion as much as we love our religion. Let's love this group as much we, as we love ourselves. And then there won't be this division. There won't be racism. There won't be hatred between groups. You know, I mean, look, I mean, I'm sorry to say, but look at the way, um, you know, the Muslims, they love themselves more than anyone else. They're, it's, they're like incapable. Okay, first of all, that's not true. Okay, well, I think- I, I think it's a mis incredibly mis I, I, th I think we I think we need to stay with the film if we yeah. can. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna really pull you back to this film. The um, love that, that Ed shows to Casey and the love that she shows for him is a both a transcendence of um, rising above all the conflicts between themselves. And through loving the other, they are starting to love themselves. Samuel is, you know, healing himself. But Raphael, you are- Buddhist, I'm a Buddhist. License to, to the <laughs> okay, wait, 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 wait. prejudices. Yeah. <laughs> it um, is so ignorant, Raphael. Yeah. So yeah. Let, us, let us move beyond yeah. this agree, conversation, which fine. I would I invite the two of you to have offline when we're no, not all together. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, a, a final question, and, um, and which is really two parts. Um, what message did you do you want the audience to receive from this film? Um, that's question number one. And question number two is, what's your next project? So I'm going to start with you, Gina, and okay. then Rafael, Rafael, and then Margot. I'm coming to you. The message that you want people to receive from this film and what your next project is. All right. Well, um, the message would be that right now, or it's late, but tomorrow there will be some kid sitting alone in the cafeteria in school. And 
that kid is hurting. And if anybody that's in school sees this movie, they might think outside of their immediate needs and say, gee, what's going on with that kid? Maybe I should invite him to my table. And so for youth, that's what I'm thinking, not, you know, that's very simple, but um, to expand one's vision of what they think they know, okay, about each other. Um, and for an adult that sees the movie, I'd like them to look at it and say, damn, if that guy can adjust his feelings at 90 years old, maybe I can, you know, and maybe, maybe I should go do something fun with somebody. I mean, you know, I'm making it sound kind of like um, suburban, but what the movie for me is, is it's about loneliness and it's about separation and it's about the notion because, you know, yes, everybody has different religions. And, but if you read the Quran, nowhere in there does it well, say well we're not go going kill. there we're not going there so okay, what's your next I'm project gina if next, you're if next you're being project pure, if you're being pure everybody will respond and what's your next project well right now i'm working on doing the musical for coyote ugly it was a wonderful movie a Thank wonderful you. movie. I look forward Thank to you. the musical for it. And Rafael, what what is your message from the movie, and what is your next project? Yes, well, I you know I it's I'm, I hope that the film shows the power of unconditional love and forgiveness, and it speaks to a big wide audience. And I hope that it will come out uh, theatrically across the United States and the world. Our distributor hopefully will be releasing it in at least selected markets next year. So I hope it will reach a wide audience and eventually be on HBO or Netflix or you know, one of the big streamers. <laughs> and my next project is about raising money. I want to start my own rebel film studio and make a lot of films very fast, films that I've tried to do for years. So we're gonna be crowdfunding this, this studio as a startup, it's called Film Art Planet. And uh, basically, I want to raise, you know, $5 million every year to do a lot of films. And I want to, on my own films, I've tried to do for many years. I've had a lot of fascinating, interesting projects, but also to help emerging filmmakers submit their films. And maybe I'll start producing um, exciting new voices as well. So, hey, invest in uh, Film Art Planet. It will be on <laughs> the internet soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And Margo. What's the message that you want people to receive from this film? And what's your next project? I just want people to be able to watch the film and see, you know, how compassionate and how loving Samuel was and, you know, start a chain reaction. Someone watches it, they see, you know, the film and they get kindness and happiness from it and they spread it to everyone else. And it, you know, it all it takes is one person really. Um, and well, I'm, I don't really, act anymore but i guess my next big thing is is college so you know being a young Argo, adult you are going to be is... the next movies <laughs> film art planet is going to be <laughs> well i want to congratulate all three of you on making this really quite extraordinary film um nancy do you i think you have some final um wrap-ups for us um, we can't see you, but I want to thank you, the three of you for um, sharing this evening with me. And um, Nancy, take it away. Wonderful. I also want to thank all of you for a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed hearing more about the film. The takeaway that I love is really that notion, and I'm going to ask you one last question about embracing the tiger. Like to me, that's about finding the courage within to do the next right thing and to be, you know, who you need to be, but in a way that is, um, you know, again, that that sense of, you know, the way Mr. Asner portrayed that unconditional love. I would love to be able to uh, embody this spirit of 
just not reacting, right? And being able to just question and be in dialogue with a person. And they've come, you know, Casey as a character kind of came to her own conclusion through this wonderful, gentle uh, nudging. And I just thought that that was beautiful. But that embracing the tiger, where did that come from? What that phrasing, because it came up a lot in the film. Didn't even know if maybe that was a possible title for the film. I'm going to ask that one last question. Well, it's a, it's an old um, Chinese proverb. Sure. And that's, um, and that's where it came from, that we all have fears. And, you know, how Chinese medicine, Chinese philosophy is not about resisting, but using the energy of the power to get what you want. Or, and that's what the tiger is. Love it. Love it, love it. May we all embrace the tiger as we move forward. I want to wish you all tremendous success in all of your future endeavors. It's been an absolute treat to have you here. Margo, thank you for my wonderful surprise. It really was was a great treat to have you join us. Um, and I'd like to thank the audience again for being part of the Jewish Film Festival and for joining us tonight. Um, if you know of anyone who'd be interested in watching Tiger Within, uh, they can still register and watch until midnight tonight. Uh, they can visit stanfordjcc.org slash film festival. Uh, the Center for Arts and Culture at the Stanford JCC offers exceptional programming throughout the year, whether book and author conversations our art gallery at the J with art and wine receptions, J Talks, book clubs, JSAC, our social action initiatives, J Cares, our volunteer opportunities, and so much more. We are starting a film club, a monthly film club. So if you're interested, please contact me. And I also just want to do a quick commercial for a wonderful program we have Thursday night. December 2nd at 7.30 p.m. at the JCC, we have Zibby Owen live. She's New York City's most powerful book influencer, award-winning podcaster and author, and along with the best-selling author, Katie Sissy, they're going to discuss why moms don't have time to dot, dot, dot. So if you're a mom out there, come join us. We'd love to have you. You can find out more about the programs at the J at our website, stanfordjcc.org. Um, thank you all again, um, everyone, for joining us, wishing you a very, very wonderful Thanksgiving. And for those of you who celebrate Hanukkah, happy Hanukkah. And we'll see you all very soon. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye. Very thank much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.